Good morning, everyone. I am Attorney Sharon Bridges, Associate General Counsel for Baptist Memorial Healthcare Corporation in Memphis, Tennessee. I work for one of the Baptist entities in Jackson, Mississippi. It's my pleasure to spend a few moments with you discussing my legal pathway. I'm a proud graduate of Morris Brown College where I received a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. I worked for several years prior to going to law school. It was while I was working at Duke University Medical Center that I decided not to go to medical school and selected law school after receiving a recommendation from then Dean Emeritus, Daniel T. Sampson, who was Dean Emeritus of the North Carolina Central University School of Law. I did not take the LSAT review course. I studied on my own with an LSAT review book and scored high enough on the first time in order to go to law school. I attended Loyola University School of Law in New Orleans, Louisiana. I have had a diverse career in, um, as part of my law uh, practice. I have served as a small defense firm lawyer, a plaintiff's, law for, a plaintiff's lawyer, a big firm defense lawyer, and in-house counsel. As you ponder what career path you will take, I submit to you to consider exploring a path of longevity in the legal profession. What does that mean? It means to consider selecting a practice area that has strong staying power. Practice areas like oil and gas, energy, insurance, healthcare, banking and finance, employment, environmental, and Im immigration. You saw the movie or the, the play Hamilton, you heard the a phrase that said, talk less, smile more. As you continue your journey in law, I submit to you to talk less, smile more. Listen to others, network more. Remember your name and try to protect your name as you continue your legal path. Remember that you can do anything, that you're always good enough and you are certainly smart enough. I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of strong women in my life. The next speaker is one of them. Earlier this year, she was assigned a case by her supervisor that would change her life forever. Undoubtedly, she was pre-selected for such a time as this, for a time when many female victims of police brutality have been forgotten. Breonna Taylor will never be forgotten due to the mighty works of this attorney and her stellar legal team. An attorney of excellence, a woman lawyer of courage, a lioness in lamb's clothing. It is my esteemed pleasure to introduce this sister lawyer, my friend, my soror, the audacious, adept, and amazing attorney, Lanita Baker. Thank you, Sharon Bridges, for that wonderful introduction. I was excited this week when I learned that you would be doing my introduction because, as you said, you are my friend. I consider you a mentor, and I knew that you would um, do a great job. Who, who else could introduce me like Sharon Bridges? So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the National Black Pre-Law Conference and Evangeline Mitchell for inviting me to serve as a keynote speaker for this incredible conference. Um, about 14, 15 years ago, I was able to attend the conference in uh, Houston as an alumni recruiter for the University of Louisville Brandeis School of Law. So I'm even more honored to be able to come back today uh, to give a keynote address. Uh, as Ms. Bridges stated, my name is Lanita Baker. I am an attorney with Sam Aguiar Injury Lawyers in Louisville, Kentucky, um, where I practice in the area of personal injury litigation as well as civil rights litigation. Prior to uh, joining Sam Aguiar Injury Lawyers, I served as, I practiced primarily in the area of criminal law, both as a defense attorney and as a um, prosecutor. Today, I'm going to talk about my decision to go to law school, wrap up with my the, working on the most high, pro, the biggest high profile case of my career, which is Brianna Taylor, and cover a little bit of everything in between um, throughout that discussion, today's discussion. There will be an opportunity to um, do questions at the end of um, this panel. 
Um, and if you have questions, I would ask that you put them in the Zoom chat, not the uh, Hoover chat, but in the Zoom chat so that I can see them. Um, so you want to go to law school, or at least you think you want to go to law school. I was a very young girl when I initially said that I wanted to be an attorney, but there was a family member who said, there's too many attorneys. You don't want to be an attorney, do something else. And so throughout, so then I was like, well, I do want a job. If I go to school, I definitely want a job. Um, so I uh, switched my career path to in high school, I was going to be a teacher. Uh, and then towards the end of um, high school, I was a, an athletic trainer for the football team. And so I was going to do sports medicine. Um, and had made that made it up. I was going to major in physical therapy, become a, a, a do sports medicine, hopefully get on with the pro uh, sports team um, in that capacity. I got to my second semester of biology in college and I said, oh, no, the sciences are not for me. <laughs> and I knew then that I needed to figure something else out because me and physical therapy uh, we just were not going to make it through four years. Uh, that lingering feeling of still wanting to be an attorney was still there. And so I decided the end of my freshman year, I'm going to go, I'm going to become a lawyer. I'm going to go to law school. Um, and that's what I did. My sophomore years when I started to study for the LSAT, um, I didn't, I, like Sharon, um, I also did not take a, a bar prep study course. I just did not have the finances um, to, to do that. I did work uh, while I was an undergraduate. Um, one thing many people don't know about me is that I'm, I'm a teenage mom. I had my daughter, she's my only child still, but I had her when I was 15, year, uh, 15 years old in high school. Um, and so I, you know, I had a strong support system um, so I know, you know, uh, a lot of people always talk about, oh, how were you able to do that? I did. I had a strong support system and I was just determined, you know, at that point, once I had my daughter um, and her name's Deanna at, um, when I was 15, that I had to be a success, not just for her, for me, but I had to be a success for her. I had to show her that regardless of what happens to you in life, you have the ability to overcome any obstacles and so um, we did it. I, I can't say I did it. We did it. It was, you know, me, Deanna, my mom, God, you know, um, we, we made a way. So um, I, I started the, that part of the discussion by saying I didn't have the money to do a bar prep study course because I was in school full time. I was carrying a, a full caseload, um, but I also worked part time in the evenings. Um, but every, you know, the little bit of money that I was making was to support her, um, support my child. And so I purchased every bar step, a uh, bar prep study book that I could, uh, not bar prep, that's later, LSAT, <laughs> uh, the LSAT prep books. Um, my favorite um, book that I had back then, it had a CD-ROM that if I'm aging myself, it was a, a Kaplan book that had a CD-ROM that went with it. So I would, you know, I uploaded that into my computer. It had tons of study courses, uh, uh, tons of tests. And the thing that I liked about that CD-ROM and taking the test on there is it was able to qualify your correct answers and your incorrect answers. And through that process, it would tell you, here's what you're strong at. Here's what you need to work on. And even when you, know, when you go from logic games to logic reasoning, it could tell me what exactly within logic reasoning was my um, pitfall. What did I need to work on to make my logical, logic reasoning scores go up? So I um, um, took a lot of those tests throughout my sophomore year. I first took my LSAT at the end of my junior year because I wanted to make sure that if I did need to retake it, that I had plenty of time to retake it before the application process. Um, luckily, I, I did only have to take it that one time. Um, the other thing that I think is important as you all um, prepare to either go to law school, I know people are at different stages in the pre-law um, debate. Some people may have already graduated undergraduate, some may be early in their undergraduate years. I chose to major in something that I enjoyed. 
um, because you can go to law school regardless of what your undergraduate major is. So my undergraduate major was psychology. I minored in sociology and um, Pan-African studies. The important thing about undergraduate and law school is just to make sure you get good grades throughout undergraduate. And I was able to do that because I enjoyed um, the classes that I, um, I enjoyed my major. So I said, in the freshman year, decided I was going to law school. I did it. I have not regretted that decision, not a single day. I love practicing law. Um, there's not a legal job that I've had that I um, did not like. Now, I will say that when I went to law school, you remember I talked about wanting to be a sports medicine, uh, do sports medicine with a professional football team. Well, I went to law school because I wanted to be a sports and entertainment lawyer. <laughs> I wanted to maybe become a um, an agent. Obviously, I'm not a sports and entertainment lawyer. I do personal injury and uh, civil rights litigation. I say that because many times we have um, the ideas of what we want to do, but it's, it, it, it doesn't end up working that way. So it's how do you adapt? How do you switch? And now and after I've been practicing since 2006, so 14 years of experience, I realized that everything that has happened has been kind of God's order, not mine. And so I'm just kind of, now I'm just like, I just follow God's path where he tells me to go, I go. Uh, so I went to law school. I wanted to do sports and entertainment law. So much so that I had to petition my law school, University of Louisville, to add both classes to our curriculum. And it's like, well, you have to show us that we have an interest that, you know, students want to go to those classes. So I got petitions together, got enough students to sign off saying, yeah, we're interested in these classes. Just because you signed the petition did not mean you would have to enroll. So it's easy to get signatures in that capacity. But people really were interested in those classes. Um, so law school was very different than any school and I'd ever done. Pre prior to law school, um, classes were, it was easy for me to get an A or a B or whatever. It was just easy. Um, high school, I don't, I, you, you bro, I, I never was one of those people where I had to spend a lot of time studying. I could sit in class, I could take a test, I would do well. Um, as I said, the LSAT, I did study for that, but I took it one time, did well. So I was just a good test taker. Law school, the first time where I really, it, it wasn't a, you can, it, it, in undergrad, I had that, it was bad. It was, you can go to class or you could read the book, but you didn't necessarily need to do both. But in law school, you definitely have to do both, right? Um, you definitely have to prep for class. You have to read. There's a lot of reading. Um, you have to outline. You have to join study groups. Maybe you could. I, I did study groups for some classes, not for others. Um, but what it, even when I did not have study groups, one thing um, that an upper level law student told me was to find the people who did well in the classes that you have and see what information you can get from them. And so I made a lot of upper level um, friends because they had already been through the classes that I've been through. And I, you know, much, in law school, they don't have any problem talking about what their GPA is and what they did in class. So you find the ones that were really smart. And I, you know, would become friends, not just for getting their outlines or notes from classes, but they would, once they like you, they will give you their notes and outlines from other classes. Sometimes they would have practice tests that they had done. Um, they could tell you what the professors um, were looking for um, because law school, it really is a game and you have to learn how to play it. Um, I realized that after my first semester, um, I'll say con it was my contracts exam, I'd gotten a C minus and I'm like, C minus, I, I, I didn't know what a C minus looked like to that point. And I was very upset by it. And, you know, I took the advice that um, your advisors give you, um, other professors that uh, may become um, 
mentors to you. I was a research assistant in my second year, but that they give you and they say to um, go talk to the teachers when you don't get the grades that you want. So I went and talked to my contracts professor and said, hey, you know, I got a C minus, you know, can you tell me what I did wrong? And he he goes to one port because I thought I knew, I know, well, not I thought, I know contracts. I knew it then, I know it now. Um, but he goes, well, you could have worded this this way. And I was like, but that means the exact same thing. Like, what do you mean? I could have worded it differently. And he's like, well, it just sounds better. And I was like, oh, wow. So that's when I, that, you know, that was a lesson learned of law professors, probably like other professors, except you prior to law school, you get a lot of multiple choice exams versus essay exams. Um, but law school with them being essay exams, the words that they use, they want you to use. They don't want you to reword it to make it sound like you would make it sound, even if it means the same thing. And so I got really accustomed and attuned to writing professors' exact words down. And that's what I would memorize. Now, of course, to digest the information, I would... Um, digest it in my own manner so that I knew that I understand it in the way that I would phrase it. But I, um, I started to really write my notes in the way that the law professors taught. In law school, my second, was it my second? No, it was my third year of law school is when I met my current employer, Sam Aguiar. And I, I don't know if he's in here today, but he was gonna try to join. But I met Sam Aguiar my third year of law school he was actually a um, transplant from Tulane Law School in New Orleans. He was down there um, at law school when Hurricane Katrina um, took place and he transferred to the University of Louisville. Well, he sat right next to me in um, professional responsibility. We didn't, of course, we didn't know anybody, but I was always that friendly person. It's just my personality. I talk to people I say hi. So he sat next to me. We had a small conversation. I knew he had transferred. Um, and um, years later, Sam said that I was one of the, the first people to speak to him at U of L, and, and probably one of the nicest people there. So uh, I say that to say you never know what impact or you know a relationship or how you uh, relate to someone at any given moment may have an impact on your life later. Um, Post-law school, remember, I wanted to be sports and entertainment. I knew it. I had joined the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association, like successfully um, got the university to offer sports law and entertainment law, two separate classes, took them both, took employment law, took all these classes that were going to help me with sports and entertainment. I graduated in 2006, which is probably one of the, um, it, the, the, Legal job market was very meh at that time. It wasn't very good. And so then I had the flashbacks to my relatives saying, don't go to law school. There's too many lawyers. You're not going to have a job. And I'm like, what in the world? Um, but I got a, I did get a job. Uh, it was with the public defender's office here in Louisville, Kentucky. I enjoyed what I um, was. I, I did enjoy being a public defender. Um, I stayed there for about two years. I did one in the adult division general where you would represent uh, individuals from any from something as small as a no insurance as major as murder. Um, that was terrifying for a brand new attorney to, you know, within my first year of practice in law, I didn't have a murder case, but I had a rape case. And it was terrifying to know that someone you have someone's entire life in your hands and you've not even been an attorney for one full year um but i will say the training that i got at the public defender's office and the fear of knowing that if i didn't do a good job i i could mess up someone's life um gave me the momentum to do what i needed to make sure that i was representing um, the individual to the best of my ability um, and, you know, and, and fully upholding his rights under the law. Um, 
I, I was in the adult division for about a year, but I really wanted to work with juveniles. So I did move to the juvenile branch uh, my second full year at the public defender's office. I enjoyed doing that because you really do, if ever um, there's a chance to, to truly try to implement the criminal justice system as it's supposed to work, which is to rehabilitate, you want to do that with juveniles, right? With minors, that's changed the uh, course of their path. And, I, and you know, I'm happy and blessed that there are times now that I see individuals that I represented when they were minors and they still call me by name. Hey, Miss Baker, they're nice. They thank me. They're on the right path. Of course, I don't have a hundred percent success rate but I do have a pretty good success rate with uh, individuals staying out of trouble. But that was more because the same way that I'm talking to you all here, I would talk to them. Uh, I think being a teenage mom um, helped me relate because I understood what, you know, getting into something you didn't know have any business doing when you're a teenager looks like, right? Um, so they could, uh, so it, it, I wasn't coming from any judgmental spot. Um, I think uh, having lost friends to either crime or to death as a as a young child or as a minor, I, I lost my father to, to my father was murdered when I was 10. So being able to go through those experiences, uh, I was able to talk to um, a lot of the kids that I, I represented, it. even the adults that I represented it too. I just have a soft spot for um for, t for, for teenagers. Um, and so I really did enjoy um, my time doing that. I left the public defender's office. Um, me and one of my good friends were like, let's open our own law firm. And we did that. And we still did primarily criminal law, criminal defense law. We did do some civil. Um, I can admit now we did not know enough about civil at that time to, to be practicing civil law cases. But um, we tried, but we, 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 again, we did mostly criminal. She moved to Atlanta. And when she moved to Atlanta, I was like, you know what, I'm going to become a prosecutor. A lot of people always ask me, why did you go from criminal defense to prosecutor? Because most people go the opposite way. I wanted to become a prosecutor because as a defense attorney, my job was never to do what's best for my client, but to get the best legal outcome for my client. So I want you all to digest that as a defense attorney, it's, it's not to do what's necessarily best in the best interest of your client. It's to get the best legal outcome. And so when I say that I want the, the best case that I can use is someone who I know has an addiction, a severe addiction to drugs, right? To get the best, to do what's in their best interest would be to hopefully get them in some type of rehabilitation program. Right. But to get the best legal outcome, if officers obtain any evidence illegally, my job was to get any get the evidence suppressed and get the case thrown out. You get the case thrown out. Your client is going right back to use drugs nine times out of 10, especially if they've not gotten any treatment uh, for that um, drug addiction. And that didn't always sit well with me because I would have those people, you know, you, you, you have one client, you know, die of an overdose at the day after you get their case thrown out. You know, it's just you, you have that sinking um, pit in your stomach. It's like, if only I could have argued for, but that's not, that wasn't my job as a defense attorney. So I became a prosecutor because I felt that I could, that could, what would be my role as a prosecutor. And so I prosecuted cases from a standpoint of what services can I offer someone so that I, they don't recidivate, come back into the criminal justice system, right? So then I could say, well, you know what? I'll give them probation. I give them another shot. I give them probation, but only if they go to rehabilitation, they go to rehab. Now, of course, we all know, you know, medically, Someone's not going to benefit from rehab until they're ready to to benefit from it. But as a in the criminal justice system, that was that that was the play the role that I played as a prosecutor. That was what I wanted to do. I didn't I wasn't 
focused on sending people to jail, but it's what resources can I provide to hopefully, so hopefully they don't come back. So that's why I became a prosecutor. I loved my job as a prosecutor. I have, I tell, I'm, I, I'm serious when I say I have not um, had a legal job that I've not loved. I've loved every single one. Whenever I leave one, it's like, oh, but you know, you, it's just, you have to grow as an attorney. You always have to grow. So uh, it, I've never left a job because I'm just like, hmm, I want to leave. I'm miserable. Like every job that I've had, I've loved. Um, while I was at the county attorney's office, I began to get involved in the National Bar Association. Uh, and I know you all have heard a lot of speakers that are involved in the National Bar Association. I am a current vice president for the National Bar Association. Um, and my first year in the National Bar Association, being active, being involved, I went to a, a regional conference in, Re uh, in Memphis. So I'm region six, so it's Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Michigan, but we were in Tennessee that year. My mouth got me in trouble. I told you all I like talking to people. I just talk, 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 make new friends. That's just kind of my personality. And um, my friend, uh, it's both Sharon and our friend, Catherine Costick, she's like, she goes back. She was campaigning for um, attorney Benjamin Crump, who, you know, is uh, known for representing the family of, uh, well, he, co he was my co-counsel in Breonna Taylor, but even before then representing the families of Trayvon Morton, uh, Michael Brown. But so Catherine was running his campaign to become president elect of the National Bar Association. I was like, well, I'll help, you know, I'll help campaign when we, the, the, the election was a couple of months off in, in Atlanta. So I joined the team, help out. Um, at some point, they determined that I, I was so vocal and a busy bee that they were going to ask me to be a chief of communications. And I was like, let me think about it. So I was the president of my local uh, bar Association, Minority Bar Association, the Louisville Black Lawyers Association. And, you know, you you, you got to leverage stuff. So I was like, well, Ben, you know, I really did help out with your campaign. Will you come and be the keynote speaker for our fundraising gala? And he was like, sure. Um, so he came. He was the keynote speaker. Well, during his speech, he announces to the room, mind you all, I've not said that I've committed to be chief of communications, but he announces to a room full of lawyers that, you know, you know, give a uh, shout out to Lanita Baker, who's agreed to be my chief of communications for my bar year. And I was like, do what? So, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. And then, you know, you, he, he's put you on the spot in front of all of your local attorneys, um, your, you know, everyone. And I was like, I guess I'm doing it now because, you know, you can't get up there and run like, mm -mm, no, I didn't agree to that. Um, but it's one of the best things that could have happened. Again, if you all have noticed, I, I started out talking about God kind of ordering my way. Sam Aguirre sat next to me in professional responsibility. Benjamin Crump, you know, helping with his campaign. Um, becoming chief of communications. And now, you know, that went from that to being a vice president for the National Bar Association. Um, Sam actually started to see some of my posts, uh, you know, when I was serving as Ben's um, chief of communications um, about, you know, and we would have to write a, a lot of things were going on during his year from um, Michael Brown, what was wrapping up, but you had uh, Terrence Crutcher being killed in Oklahoma. Um, you, it, you know, it, it, it was a lot. You had the host claw who was uh, an officer that was raping women. Um, there were so many things that we would have to write about that, you know, I did start to get an inkling for civil rights because if I'm writing as, you know, for Ben Crump, um, you know, you can't write about these cases and not uh, feel some type of impact from them, some, some type of emotion from those. Um, so, you know, I'm working. At some point, I reach out to Sam and, you know, it's like, hey, 
I, I wasn't necessarily looking for a job, but I was looking for something different because again, I had been, by the time I reached out to Sam, I had been at the prosecutor's office. I think I reached out to him probably a year before I actually ended up joining his firm. Um, Cause it took that long for me to make the ultimate decision to, yeah, it's time for me to go and to grow and to blossom um, and to do more meaningful work than I had already been able to do. Um, but it was hard to leave the, the prosecutor's office knowing the impact that I, I felt I was making there. And I felt like the, the type of, I was the type of prosecutors that we need more of. Um, so it was hard to leave that role, but I also had to, to grow. Um, it probably did help my, my last year at the county attorney's office where I prosecuted for, I did legislative work for Metro Council. Um, so that kind of ties into, you know, our Breonna Taylor settlement as well. Um, we, we were able to negotiate some police reform. We pushed for Breonna's law at the local level um, we're pushing for it at the state level as well, but because of my prior experience working uh, with Metro Council and on drafting ordinances and knowing their process, I knew that we could get an ordinance passed much quicker. So that's another thing that went into um, the, the 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 experience and you know working on the Brianna Taylor case. It's it's all of these things from being a criminal defense attorney to prosecutors working hand in hand every day with police officers, knowing proper procedures with um, police to legislation with Metro Council to now that I'm at um, working at Sam Aguilar's injury lawyer, uh, injury lawyers. Brianna Taylor was not my first civil rights case, but it is the first case that I have that went as high profile as it did. Um, the other civil rights, so I, I hate to say it's my biggest case because I think all civil rights cases are big because of the impact that they have on everyone, but it is definitely the most high profile case. Um, it has definitely taken the most, um, made me grow the most as a person and as an attorney and to stretch um, what it means to to be an effective counselor for your client. Um you know, people always ask us, how did you all come to police reform being a part of the Breonna Taylor civil settlement? And it's because Tamika Palmer, Breonna's mom said, told us, she is like, you know, I, at the end of this, it, it's not about money. One, she wants to know, you know, exactly what happened to Breonna, why it happened to Breonna. Two, she wanted justice for Breonna. And three, she wanted to make sure that what happened to Breonna didn't happen to anyone else to the best that she could. So to ensure that it doesn't happen to anyone else, the only thing that you can do is work on reform. Because if you just get money and no reform, it's gonna happen to someone else, right? Um, so that's um, where that reform came from. Um, and it's necessary and I think that my role with Brianna, you know, we had, we, it, it was a team. It was Benjamin Crump, myself, and Sam Aguilar. Um, and it started out being Sam Aguilar and myself. Ben had reached out because when, in, in May, after Ahmaud Albury's case began to gain some traction in the news, um, posts about Brianna began to go viral on social media. So Ben calls, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm reading some stuff about this case about Brianna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky. Do you know anything about it? And I said, yeah, Ben, that's my case. That's me and Sam's case. Um, so he just asked a couple of questions about it. We talked about it. Um, when I hung up the phone with, with Ben, I called Sam and I said, hey, Sam, I said, you know, Ben just reached out about Brianna's case. And Sam's immediate, like, I didn't, I think that's all I got out. Sam's like, what do you think about bringing him in? I was like, I think it could do us some good. So, you know, we do what initially we have to talk to Tamika Palmer, Brianna's mom, to make sure she's okay with that. Because, you know, as much as we knew it would go high profile, we have to make sure that Tamika is willing to accept that spotlight um, that would be put placed on her when a case like this gains that much notoriety. 
um, Tamika actually had to think about it at first. So she thought about it and then she called back. She said, yeah, she's like, I think that, you know, that that's a good move. We should go ahead and do it. So we went through the process of introducing Tamika to Ben um, and everything that we needed to do on our end to bring in Ben as a part of the legal team. The day, two days after that conversation, Ben's office sent a press release out saying that you know, he had joined the team. The this case has not been it. It, it, it took off from there. It's not been the the, the same since. Um, so it's just. But the the thing that sticks with me the most is being able to have such a widespread. I think it was definitely necessary, definitely the right move, because you know, even as I was sitting here last night and I watched Law and Order SVU they say Brianna Taylor's name in the same sentence as the way that, you know, the old police book, it doesn't apply anymore after, you know, George Floyd and Brianna Taylor. And so it's it, the police departments recognize and the world recognize and even our politicians recognize that this isn't business as usual in the way that we police in America. And I think that as you do civil rights uh, work, if you choose to do civil rights work, that you have to have it as a goal on changing the way things are done, um, because that's the only way to make it lasting. Um, I'm supposed to talk until 1.30 for questions, but I see some questions in the chat, so I'm going to go back and look for questions, and I'll open it up, go ahead and open it up for questions so that it's not just me talking to you all. Um, but one, the other question I always get is, how do you determine what um, civil rights cases to take or what type of cases to take? With civil rights, it's definitely a gut instinct. What does your gut tell you about the case at the beginning? And you kind of have to follow, um, follow your gut on there because it is. They're emotional. They're heavy. You, 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 know, you or someone you know may have been impacted by the very issues that you're going to be litigating. So you have to make sure that you're able to do an effective job in doing it and that you truly feel it. So I think that that's one thing um, as you do. So I'm going through, shout out to the single moms. Yes, strong support system, single dads too. I, 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 oh, I did teach evidence. Um, I, I, so I've served as an ad, adjunct professor. So I've seen some single dads when I was out there um, Someone said Khan Academy is a free LSAT prep. When I went back to get my MBA, Khan Academy existed. It was not in around when I was in school, but Khan Academy is great. So um, it's K-H-A-N, if you didn't see that. Someone asked me my LSAT score. Ooh, I don't remember it, but it was high enough to not have to take it again. I got into all three schools that I applied, and I do think that that's one thing that I kind of glossed over. So in so I ended up still staying here in, in Louisville, going to University of Louisville. I did that because, again, being a single mom, my support system was here. Law school was hard enough. Um, I was that person that broke the rule. I think they've changed the rule now. When I was in, When I started law school, first years could not work at all. I didn't have the luxury of not being able to work. Um, I don't, if you can go through it and not work, I would recommend not working, but I also know the feasibility of, of not being able to work. But I wish I could have done it without working, but I did work. But when you're choosing your law schools, one, make sure, you know, if you have children that you have some type of support, it's too hard or, or that the school has a good support system. It's too hard to, to go through law school as a single parent with no support. Um, if you don't have children, you really do have to think about your practice areas. I said, I want to do sports and entertainment law. We don't have no professional teams in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> so where was I going to, or, you know, we don't even, and I had to lobby to get those classes where you have Marquette, Tulane, you have schools that, uh, or Texas, you have schools that have these programs in place already. So really think about what is it that you think that you want to practice and look for schools that have those programs. 
But again, I'm very happy not doing sports and entertainment law. So you never know. I thought that's what I wanted to do, but obviously it wasn't meant for me to do that. Although I am getting to do some of it now on the back end of Brianna Taylor. So a long way around, you know, I'm, I'm having to look at licensing de- deals, releasing, release, um, appearance releases, all of this stuff. So in a roundabout way, I'm getting to do those. So, um, so be, be wise in your choices for law school where you think you may go cost of living where you want to go like everybody wants to go to california but if you don't have enough financial aid or resources to go to california or support system to stay with somebody in california don't put yourself in in a more stressful situation than necessary because law school itself is already uh, stressful so that was that when you all start law school, Iraq will be ingrained in your brain. Yes, issue, rule, analysis, conclusion, I think. Yep. Someone said they work in corrections. I'm speaking the truth. They know who's genuine and who's not. Yes, yes. Your cl- If you do criminal law, your clients know when you're being genuine or when you're just trying to, and you have to, like, I say criminal law in any area of law, you have to be genuine. Uh, people know, even in civil rights work, even in personal injury, they know when you just saying something to get them off the phone. Uh, that's one thing that also attracted me to uh, Sam's office is that his focus is on customer service. And um, I mean, of course, giving great legal uh, representation as well, but it's a su- customer service based a model like we want to make sure that we're communicating with our clients that they're in the know about what's going on and I think that that's important uh, and it goes to the genuineness and we're not just because lawyers also as everyone needs lawyers for various things in life but we're the most hated profession for some reason we shouldn't be but we are um is it difficult to own your own firm it is. It was harder for me because I had no clue about any. Um, bi- I didn't have any business sense whatsoever. So, and neither did my the the my friend that we opened our firm with. We just so we got out there. We winged it. No no guidance on what to do. Right. Um, I would say that had I been involved in the National Bar Association at the time that I decided to open my own firm, that it probably would have been a little bit easier because there would have been individuals that I could reach out to for guidance on how to do it, how to set it up. So, and it doesn't necessarily, I say the National Bar Association because I've gotten so much out of it, but there are other organizations. Um, I, I wanna stress the importance of being involved in legal organizations for the resources that they have. Um, but it, it, it was difficult. Um, you know, but, and that's why later in life, like I went back later, even though I, after I graduated law school, I said, I'm never going to school again. Um, but I went back in 2015 to get my master's in business administration because I just knew from having the social sciences background to then going to law school, there was just so much about everyday life that I did not know or recognize. So, um, I'm happy that I went back that, that, If I didn't love practicing so much, that would be the most valuable degree that I have. But I have to have my law degree to be able to practice law. But that's another good degree. So if you're on the fence, and I'm also a person that I want everyone to go to law school. I love being a lawyer. But if someone, if there's anyone out there that's like, I'm going to law school because they say I can do anything with a law degree, look at other options. Go to law school because you want to be a lawyer, maybe a politician. But law school is stressful, it's difficult to just want to do it to have it. Like I know they used to say it was the most universal degree since I've gone back to get my MBA. I think the MBA is probably the most universal degree if you don't want to practice law. But if you want to be a lawyer, go to law school, learn the game, make it work for you. Um, While we need, we do need better social services. I'm glad I changed your uh, thinking, Tiffany, on defense attorney and prosecutor. I, I encourage everybody, be a prosecutor. That's where you can have the most impact on the criminal justice system. Everyone runs away from wanting to be a prosecutor. But everything that we see that is wrong with the criminal justice system is because of prosecutors. It's not the role. It's the people that are in those positions, in my opinion. Do 
team resources are usually really efficient. Yep. So it's that they are different arenas in the defense area they're originally be in. Which one of these? So someone asked me, um, they say, I've served in different arenas, including defense attorney, um, prosecutor, chairperson for the NBA, and also recruitment. Which one of these is the most rewarding for you? I think they all um, provide something different for me. Um, I will say being involved in the National Bar Association has given me more confidence as an attorney to see other Black attorneys being successful, uh, pouring into you, you know, giving you advice, um, helping you grow. Um, that I could, I, you can't get that from a law book. So, um, so probably the being involved in the National Bar Association has been um, the most beneficial in, me in growing as a Black female attorney. And I say that I'm I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. We have about a hundred black attorneys total in the city, but everyone's so spread out and everyone's in their own bubble. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the things that I was needing in terms of mentorship and guidance, um, I, I wasn't necessarily getting from my local uh, community. So when I joined the National Bar Association, even Sharon probably didn't know, doesn't know that I consider her a mentor because we're such great friends. But some people in the National Bar I become friends with, but I learned so much from them. Um, so that's good. If there are any Black lawyer student organizations in Sa Southern California, please let me know because there aren't any at my school, unfortunate. Um, BALSA is typically at most schools. Um, are we, I guess we're talking about undergraduate though. Um, Tiffany, I'll see. Are you talking about undergraduate or in law school, Tiffany? Hold on, let me. I'm going to try to unmute you. I think I can. I'm talking about in law school. I'm a 1L and we don't have any. So you don't have BALSA there? Mm -mm. Okay. I, um, send me your email address, like in a chat, and I'm going to connect you with the, the National Bar Association, does have a student division. A law student division is free to join, um, but I will connect you with the division, law student division chair. They have a position on the board. Uh, so shoot me uh, your email address and anyone else. Um, I guess if you guys do connect with me on the Hoover, I guess that'd be better than trying to put it in the chat and me take all of them down. So I, I do have the Hoover. I just didn't have it brought up while I'm doing this presentation. So send me a note, any, that goes for anyone, send me a note and I can connect you with the uh, law student division share. Again, it's free to join, uh, a lot of resources. Um, the, the division itself does try to, um, they raise money so that the students can um, potentially come to the convention. Um, our convention, our last convention was virtual. Next year may be virtual depending on what COVID does, but it's definitely good opportunities. Um, so yeah. A lot of Southern California folks. So Kaden asks, how do you deal with the emotions from working um, this case? I find it really difficult to not lose myself in emotions of anger and pain from this case. Um, it was, it's difficult. Um, and there were days I would come home, I would cry. I just, uh, you just let it out. There were days when, you know, my friends and uh, sorority sisters would come by and just hang out, let me vent, let me cry, do something different to, to distract me. Um, but you do have to, uh, being able to talk to my co-counsel, being able to talk to Tamika and sometimes talking to Tamika Palmer was uh, enough to, to make me shape up because I had to be strong for her. You know, she lost her daughter. So uh, what right do I have to let my emotions get in the way of me fighting for justice for her? So sometimes it was just a call to her and, and you know, seeing how she, like her strength um, floors me. So so that, that it, it's all kind of things. Having uh, the Until Freedom team here, uh, Tamika Mallory and my son, Lennon, Angelo Pinto and, and Linda Sarso are having them here 
um, working on the case and having someone, you know, they, I, they were able to do so much on, and, and people have this misconception that we hire them, but no, this is what Until Freedom does. They're activists. So being able to have them really galvanize and help push our, our, our case and um, the, the true issues out there, um, that gave me another source of relief release being able to talk to them about things so it's just having people to, that, that can't that you can talk to um do you think senator Rand paul will vigorously push for the justice for brianna taylor act to pass in the senate i think that senator i don't know that i would say vigorously i think he will push for it because it's been kind of um no knock warrant. He one, he was vocal from from jump. It wasn't just um so he 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 didn't have to wait for someone to tell him to 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 get on board. So as soon as America started to find out about it, he was like, hey, let's let's introduce this legislation. I haven't looked at his in depth because we've been working so much on state legislation, trying to get state laws passed. But banning no knock warrants would go hand in hand with uh, a lot of Senator Paul's um, stances. He's a less government type person, right? So I think he'll definitely push for it. I just don't know um, what the rest of his party will decide to do because they've taken a more pro-law enforcement approach to things. Case law versus statutory law, which should lawyers tackle first in civil rights cases? You have to tackle them both at the same time. Um, I mean, statutory law is always going to trump case. Like you, you can have a, a case law that's out there, but if if a law gets passed to to overrule that case, then it's that that statute that that is controlling. Um, but you have to make sure that when you're uh, when you find a statute that you think applies to your case, that you're also looking up case law for specific facts. Um, a lot of things that you hear about in civil rights cases are qualified immunity. And um, the way that qualified immunity is written is very case specific, fact driven. Um, it's not an automatic bar, you know, we hear so much about it, but it's really more complicated than um, the media and a lot of people um, make it out to be. So um, when you're going to do civil rights cases, you got to do your your case law research and your statutory research. One thing, and then you also have to be very strategic. Um, one thing that we did with Brianna's case was decide to file in state court first, like we could have filed in, in uh, federal court. Um, but the thing about it is we still need it. We wanted information, we wanted information fast. Um, and so we wanted to be able to start our discover discovery process as soon as possible. In state court, we could do that as soon as the parties were served. In federal court, we would have gone through probably a, um, a, an answer, a motion to dismiss, a scheduling conference, and not to after that scheduling conference um, discovery. Like, uh, and to give you an example, my uh, one of my other civil rights case that we did file solely in um, federal court because that was our only claims were federal uh, civil rights violations. Um, we filed it in August of last year. We're just now. Uh, getting an order to do the scheduling plan and our scheduling conference next month. So that's well over a year before we're getting to do any of the discovery process. So that's just kind of the strategic part of civil rights cases. Do you have any advice for young moms who are starting this process? If it's, you know, mine is to have as strong of a support system as you can. It's not always going to be like, I was blessed that, you know, that my mom was there and able to be that support system that I needed. But sometimes it's going to be friends. Sometimes it's going to be other single moms that you have to rely on, but it has to be a reliable. So it, it doesn't, you know, it just has to be a reliable support system. Someone that, you know, it, you know, if you have class, they're going to be there, you know, um, they're not going to call you at the last minute to say, oh, something came up. I can't do it. You know what I mean? It's almost they have to have that same. And, and so I say other moms because other moms need that same reliability that you're needing. Right. 
So that so that's the source. And I will say that some of my the people that I did study with in law school were other single moms because it would be a situation where we might have to let our kids go play somewhere while we're studying. Uh, it's easier to do that um, with other people who have kids who understand. Um, how did you handle the initial disappointments in the case? So um, the biggest disappointment is still there and I've not handled it. Um, well, I'm still angry about it. And it's the fact that uh, Daniel Cameron chose not to present charges on behalf of Brianna to the grand jury. As a former prosecutor, that pisses me off. Um, as the family representing, uh, I mean, as the attorneys representing Brianna's family, it pisses me off. Um, and I'm still angry about it. And we're just using, I'm using that anger um, to push for a different outcome. You know, we, we recently filed an application to get him off of the case because he's shown that he will not seek justice, you know, and it's not that we're asking for anything different to happen for Brianna. We just want her to be treated the same as anyone else would be treated. And so um, he, I mean, it, it would be one thing if he presented charges on behalf of Brianna Taylor to the grand jury, but he failed to do so, refused to do so. Um, if he had presented them and the grand jury said, no, we're not going to indict, I'd be sad, but I could stomach it as a, it, this is the criminal justice system. But the fact that he just chose not to, it, it, it makes me angry. So I'm still working on that. How are you so involved and maintained a dis decent work-life balance? Well, the National Bar Association now has, it, 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 it is work, but it's not like, so many of my, my closest friends are also in the organization. And so, you know, when we're working on NBA, we're working together. And so you balance that um, time. Um, I would say the thing that I wish I would um, had more time for, she's 20, my daughter's 24 now. But you do go, but like, well, when she was in high school, I worked at the county. I was able to do a lot. Like she ran track, did um, volleyball. So uh, she was very active throughout school. But sometimes you wish like, oh, well, maybe we could have done, you know, a little, a few more vacations. And that's kind of like mommy guilt. And so for the single moms, you're going to have mom guilt. Um, I don't know. There is not anything that I can say to make you not have mom guilt. It's just part of being a mom or dad. Um, you you have it so um so that's the the one part of my work-life balance that i um I, I wish i could have done a little bit differently before but working on it now um but you also pick jobs and you work for employers if work-life balance is important to you you have to 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 go somewhere that um understands that and also in respects that I would say mine is I, I like to travel I still travel well not still like cause COVID but I travel a lot but I'm also the person that when I travel my work computer goes with me uh, we're a paperless firm for the most part so there it's nothing for me to do work um, when I travel so you just have to if travel is important for you you have to be you have to be willing to work because you do have to get your work done at the end of the day. You have an obligation to your clients. I think I answered that as a former prosecutor. How do you feel about the way they he he did not handle? Um, Daniel Cameron did not handle um, the grand jury process well, and then he lied to America about it, and not just America. He lied to Tamika Palmer about it. So that that made it. There's no excuse for any prosecutor to behave in that manner. Um, and we will need to um, wrap up pretty soon. So do you want to do maybe one more question in there? Uh, yep, I'm going, yeah. I'm scrolling through. So yeah. I got a request waiver work. MBA JD programs, I think they would be good. I didn't do mine together, but I think those, I, I wish I had, so I didn't have to go back later. Mm -hmm. uh, have you faced racism as an attorney? I'll do that for this group. Um, you do. You get. Uh, you go into court. Um, you can see a sheriff every day, and they still do the 
treat you as if you're a client or a defendant. Um, don't believe that you're an attorney or you're a social worker or you're a court reporter. Um, th there's always that surprising, are you? Um, and you just, I just show, like I, I've taken it my whole life of that I'll just show people better than I can tell them. You know, I am an attorney. I can kick anyone in here's butt in court. Um, that's kind of my mentality of being a black, and it's black and female. So I have the, 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 the double whammy. Um, just brush it off and go. Mm -hmm. Now, is it? I thought, okay, yeah, 145, we're done. 45? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was um, 30. Yes, you're okay. Yeah, you just lay out of your work through detention. Mm -hmm. <sighs> wrong side of history luckily the I, I didn't have to interact like America has shown Daniel Cameron that he's on the wrong side of history what advice would you give to a first generation family prospective law student I was a first generation law student uh, I was actually the first person in my family to graduate undergraduate so let alone law school so that advice that I would give you is to seek out mentors who have done it. When you go to law school, I, I, I briefly said that and I was supposed to go back to it. I was a research assistant uh, for one of my professors. That professor is still one of my best friends. I, I, I still have to call them Professor Powell. He's like, I'm Cedric. I'm like, no, you're Professor Powell. You'll always be Professor Powell. Um, so mentors, law um law professors, find some that you can really relate to and talk to uh, to help you the ropes through law school and then find attorney practitioners um, to help lead you through because it is, it's a journey and you, you do need help. And that's why I, I emphasize the National Bar Association in being that for me and helping me really recognize and, and grow into my full self as an, my full potential as an attorney. Did you say, I'm trying to see if there's any. Um, the FBI is also, they're still doing their investigation for Miss for Brianna's case. And she does have a victim's advocate provided there, but I think we probably serve more in that role for her than uh, them. And I think that's pretty good. Thank you. I, I, I enjoy talking to, to potential law students, law students. So Evangeline, anytime you want me to speak, I'm there.